Hello, welcome to another episode of History Hack. We have a favourite back today. Who have we got, Alex? We have got the most desirable man in World War I circles. That has an, a caveat attached to it, though. It's all the other middle-aged men. Well, it's all the middle-aged men, because he's not middle-aged, who are dying to get their hands on Nikolai Eberholst. You are the pin-up of sweaty middle-aged mandom. How do you feel about that? Weird. People adored you on that three-part <laughs> Austria-Hungary thing. I'm happy. But kind of, Giles even make, rang me from weird. America to tell you how much he loves you and how he's read every book you recommended oh, and loved good. it. So feel free to recommend the shit out of things tonight because they love you. It is Sorry. creepy, but that's why I love reminding you of it. How does your wife feel about it? I haven't told her that part, but you've told me many times that it, ne- it it never not it's never not weird and strange <laughs> when you say it. <laughs> I I have uh, sent bribery sticker presents to your children um, you so that your you wife have. likes me because I keep stealing you for <laughs> World War One stuff. Um, but yeah, so how are you anyway? House move. Oh, good. Yeah, house moving and uh, second lockdown in Denmark just started today. Oh, so, okay. uh, yeah, a little uh, stressed at work since tomorrow will be the last day uh, at work and then work from home. Are they furloughing you? Oh, uh, no, I have to work. Oh, boo. <laughs> They've not furloughed you at all so you can do your war stuff, not have they? All. No, Damn not at them. all. Damn them. Right, okay. We, uh, you, uh, do you like the title of this? The Reality of Neutrality, it almost rhymes. <laughs> That's perfect. <laughs> I know. We're going to talk, because uh, you talked all about Austria-Hungary last time, which is a big passion yeah. of yours. But I know, like, if you say to someone like Alina, who's still there, possibly, uh, and hasn't fallen asleep yet, Denmark in World War I, she'll go, oh, uh, neutral, what do you care? But that's why we're here, because we're going to talk about neutrality and what that actually meant aren't we yeah uh we're going to talk about some danish witnesses to the first world war yeah that i've picked from all kinds of different sources and from all kinds of different sides yeah it's going to be really good um let's let's start with the obvious so neutrality denmark is supposed to be neutral which means that denmark should play no part in the war which yes. we're going to see is just not the case, even if you are neutral. But let's talk about that standard view. Let's talk about what it was like to be in Denmark during the First World War uh, when your country is not participating in Because you've dug up uh, a few sources for us, haven't you? Yeah, I found some sources in, in the archive where I work, the Copenhagen City Archives, uh, which did a lot of collections from uh, pensioners in the 60s. Uh, and of course, a lot of those were, were young people during the war. Uh, and they've written extensively uh, uh, about how it was to be uh, young in a in a neutral country, but doing a war. Uh, and I think it will surprise many that while Denmark, of course, was neutral, um, the war really, you know, doesn't occupy a very big part of our collective memory uh, today. But it has a massive impact on the country, and the effects of the war is felt by everyone every day during the war. Um, to to a, a much larger degree than I, than I think most people would would recognize today, um, and um, you know at first when the war war is declared, there's there's a, of course a fear uh, that Denmark will be dragged into it like so many other countries, um, and this is really felt of course uh, amongst the, the the population in general, uh, and um, one girl. Uh, was a girl called uh, Eva, uh, sorry, Vera Ber- Berquist, who just turned 14 a few weeks before the war broke out. And she uh, recalled the first days of the war like this, and I quote, people gathered and discussed in serious clusters. It couldn't be, but it was. A man who lived on the first floor of our building suddenly disappeared. He was Russian and had been called up. The next one who disappeared was our neighbor, also called up. He was German. That's how it went on. Yes, it was serious war between the great powers in Europe. So immediately, uh, the war is felt by by the people, and you see it in 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 this in the cityscape, if you will. Uh, you you see people disappear. You see see uh, you know it's in the middle of summer. All the tourists disappear. There's ads in the papers. 
uh, calling for people to of of the warring nations to turn up at the embassies if they they're supposed to go to war if they reservist if if they want to volunteer for that matter um, so so a lot of people feel it this way um, and uh, it made a, a very big impression on a lot of people another uh, girl about the same as, as the first is a girl called Chua Giza. And she also remembered uh, the first days, especially when um, when Denmark mobilized. We didn't mo- mobilize fully. We sort of called up a small force uh, called the Security Force, mm-hmm. uh, which was a, a, a kind of a reservist army. Uh, and she writes, uh, when the First World War broke out in August 1914, it made a big impression, even on the children. The Security Force was called up fairly quickly to assert Denmark's neutrality. The many conscripts filled the uh, street scene and many homes suffered under the conscription of the provider. Since there was nothing called radio at the time, the newspapers were heavily studied and the, a great deal of people's conversations were about the war. Even in schools, discussions often went high among the te- both teachers and students and between the groups. So um, what she's talking about is, of course, that, that while we are not at war, men are being called up um, and these are not men who have to go to war, but they have to leave their families and sometimes for very long periods of time. Uh, one of these men uh, later wrote that, uh, and I quote here, uh, I was called up for extra military service many times with the security force. Altogether, I was a soldier for 35 and a half months and that without being punished. So despite the country being neutral, uh, Men, men like this still had to spend three long years in the army sometimes. Mm-hmm. And they would be manning fortifications, they would be digging trenches, they would be guarding various military installations. Uh, a lot of people just pretty much describe it as being extremely boring. Uh, a few times you'd see an aircraft passing by, a ship or something like that. But most of the time they just awaited uh, the time when they were allowed to go home. But, uh, of course, this absence from home um, could be especially hard for for the people who were their family's sole breadwinners. Um, and later on, you, you have the, the um, economic repercussions of the war. Mm-hmm. You have the, uh, the rationing of various foodstuffs and other goods. And towards the end of the war, you know, the country didn't escape the Spanish flu either. Um, Still, There's also uh, separation, yeah. isn't there, as well? Because, I mean, like, at the very highest, the very lowest in society. So the Danish royal family, uh, Queen Alexandra is Danish. They can't go and see yeah. any of the Danish family for the entirety of the war because of course. it violates neutrality. And that's the same for Danes everywhere, isn't it? That they are yes, cut they off. can't travel. Yeah. Uh, so, some are allowed to travel to other neutral nations, but, but it, it's made extremely difficult. Uh, especially in the war with the with Germany declaring unrestricted submarine warfare, you know it, it's just incredibly dangerous to 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 sail across the, the sea. Even even small crossings like to Sweden could be uh, dangerous. Um, yeah, so 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 there is a a, a lot of um, isolation of the country, and that's also where where you see this uh, the rationing of food stuff is because we we can't get the the normal uh, supplies because Germany won't uh, allow foodstuff to come in. Uh, a, a lot of allied nations will not sell to Denmark because they fear that Denmark would then trade with Germany that mm-hmm. they're trying to block off. So they're, they're caught in the middle really um, and trying to, to maintain neutrality uh, and doing pretty good at that. They, they, they are quite successful that uh, you know, there 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 are a few times where the where they have to um, show some force uh, if if uh, especially uh, submarines come too close or or some ships get too close or or aircrafts, for example, fly over over uh, Danish national territory. But generally, it it's uh, fairly quiet on that front. But still, you know. Um, the war has a big impact, but it also generates a lot of excitement in in society in general, especially for for young people or young boys. Especially, uh, they are they are very excited to see the mobilization of the army at the time. Uh, they uh, they eagerly await news, and some some even describe like that everybody had maps that they would 
mark with flags of the army's locations and move them around when the newspapers came. Uh, so, so in that sense, it's also great excitement uh, being on the sideline and not active. Um, and then there's, of course, also some people who make a lot of money on the war, uh, yeah. especially um, selling food stuff uh, to the belligerent nations. And in, in Denmark, these, these men were called goulash barons, uh, and they became notorious for selling canned meat of dubious quality and origin to, to Europe's armies. Um, one of these, the most famous ones, uh, are all well-known names, but one of the most famous ones in Copenhagen uh, was a guy called Berliner Nielsen, uh, who became famous for purchasing a couple of water buffaloes from the Copenhagen Zoo and sold them to a meat processing plant that sold to German Germany. Oh God! Uh, so, so, <laughs> they're big so they're, bastards, though those water buffaloes. Oh, they are, they are, and uh, there's a lot of, of of dubious canned meat in that <laughs> animal. Uh, yeah, but um, but of course these men were, were really resented by the general public, as they were earning a lot of money uh, on the war, while most people struggled to feed. Uh, if I can just finish uh, with one story that I really mm-hmm. wanted to get to uh, of the neutrality, just. Um, just because I think it really shows how how much of an impact the uh, the war could have on on people's lives. Uh, this is from uh, a, a, a woman called Katinka Anderson, uh, who was 24 years old in 1914 when the war broke out, and she had just gotten married and was about to start life with her new husband when war broke out. And she writes. Um, what distress and poverty the war brought. My husband worked at Magazine du Nord, which is a large department store in Copenhagen. Mm-hmm. Uh, all, all the workers were fired, and we had to stand in queues to the soup kitchen to get food. There were days when we didn't eat at all. My husband tried to sell fruit from a cart, but he, it didn't pay much. He couldn't stand seeing the poor children, so, uh, so when they came to beg, he couldn't say no and had to stop. We had to pawn everything we owned. Then my husband was hired by the military, there he was paid two crowns to sew a pair of trousers. In 1919, the Spanish flu came and ravaged Denmark. We lost our little son, one year old. So yeah. you see it that even beyond the borders of the military nations, the war could dramatically impact the life. Uh, these are all consequences stemming from the war on a life in neutral Denmark themselves and their families. Um, you spoke yeah. a bit about cross loyalties already, but um, what, and we've sorry. mentioned cross loyalties, and we've mm. mentioned Queen Alexandra already. She hated the Germans, and it was because of something that happened in the 1860s, in that Germany snatched a bit of territory that was full of Danish people, um, mm. and this causes a problem in World War One, doesn't it? Because there are Danes fighting all over the place in world war one and you wanted yeah. to tell us about this group from a particular region didn't you yeah uh, a big part of of uh, of the southern part of jutland which is uh, the mainland denmark became german after the second Schleswig war in 1864 uh, and of course there were a lot of danes living in this region naturally as it was part of denmark uh, and so during the first world war as german subjects these men were uh, f- required to serve in the German military like any other uh, ethnic Germans were. Uh, and they were quite often reluctant to do so, but while a few managed to flee to Denmark, most of them uh, served to, in their words, preserve the Danish minority culture in Schleswig, uh, which the area was called, um, and, and to keep uh, the hope of one day returning uh, to to Denmark alive. And it's not hard to imagine that, that Germany would be cracking down hard on this minority after the war if mm-hmm. the Danes had refused to serve. So a lot of, of uh, young men did serve, even though they didn't want to, just to, to maintain that, that uniqueness and, and Danish culture uh, in case Germany won, uh, in case Germany lost, and, and this part of... of um, of Germany wouldn't return to Denmark. You didn't know at the time, of course, but uh, somewhere between 30 and 35,000 Danes served in the German army. Uh, most of these came from uh, the northern part of Schleswig, some 27,000, which today is also the part uh, that became Danish again. Uh, and the remaining came from southern Schleswig, but 
those numbers are a little more uncertain and and it's hard to say who were Danes, who were Germans, because the uh, the cultures mix a little more. So you've got they're in it from the very beginning, aren't they? Um, but before we talk about some of the engagements where they fought, you've told me once before about you have a story, don't you, of a guy that literally his friends had to drag him off to war. Uh, there, there are a lot of stories about, about uh, how how the soldiers were, had to be dragged off to the to the train stations by their comrades, uh, leaving their families behind. Um, one of the ones that I really liked, and one of the ones I picked for for this, uh, is by uh, a guy called Peter Funk, who's a farmer. He's a husband, and he's a father of a small baby boy when the war broke out. Uh, and I picked this one as an example of what these men experienced when they were mobilized in, in early August 1914. Uh, and I really want you to know the the contrast between this scene that, that Peter describes and this all too familiar scene of, of the crowd smiling and the young men marching off to the war and arm in arm and with flowers and all that. Um, he writes, uh, and, and I, this is a little bit longer, but I think it's worth it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, he writes... My wife and I had talked very little since the mobilization order came. Only now, when the others on the farm had retired or had traveled to their home, did we finally become one. The urge to go to bed was not present. We both felt, as strongly as only people who love each other can feel it, the urge to be alone but not to sleep together. No, be awake together. Yes, it was as if the feeling uh, was bursting through our minds. If we could just stay awake and be together for the entirety of the short time left before I was going away. Sleeping only stowed away precious time. As one, we walked down the road towards the forest, not just in each other's arms, no, like two people clinging to each other, uh, never to let go again, no matter what may come. Talking proved difficult, as we both felt the inner emotions too strong to talk about openly. The evening was calm and quiet and really nice, mild and peaceful summer evening. But it was as if this gentleness and peace by nature came into conflict with what was about to happen. Oh, why this devout beauty and peace in nature? When I so soon, no, the thought could not uh, be thought to an end. We walked slowly along the field road, and one side, uh, the, the grain stood strong with heavy bent ears, soon ready to be harvested. Somewhat further on, on the opposite side of the road, lay the cows and young cattle chewing, A couple of the horses were still grazing. Everything was peace and quiet around us, nature, the grain, the horses, the cows. And in a few days, I was to be torn out of this beautiful rural peace. And so we had reached the first hedgerow. On the other side stood a good four hectares of oats for breeding. It's the prettiest oats I've seen, the consultant uh, said when he came to check it out. And now I couldn't take part in the harvest. Here, everything collapsed for me. Here, it suddenly overwhelmed me. These oats I would never see again, and how much of what was on the farm would I ever see again? Should I be permitted to return? And what about our two-month-old boy? Should he experience seeing his father anymore? Here, at the first first hedgerow on the right side of the forest road, with my wife clinging to me, I experienced a young man's farewell to all that meant life to him, deed, task, and hope, and to everything and everyone who was dear to me. Let's turn around. I can no longer, I said. Slowly we went back to the farm. At home, our little boy was sleeping peacefully, unaware of the disturbances of world peace. We went to bed. The day was over. Yeah. So... Go on then, tell us what happens to him. We don't know, but he does survive the war. Uh, He does. It's the only account he leaves, uh, this short writing but um he writes it after the war so we know he survived (laughs) so at at least (laughs) yeah um but we don't know what exactly happened to him um so as uh as uh, you mentioned earlier they're they're in it from the beginning uh and and what's amazing about these accounts is that that while 30 35 people is not very many it's just a drop in the giant ocean of men that took part in the war they left a lot of accounts um and uh being that they were in it from the beginning and in a lot of places we really have a lot of accounts from some of the most famous battles of the war uh from mons from marne tannenberg 
we have Champagne, Verdun, Somme, Passchendaele, and so on. Uh, there's almost not a single place that you don't find a Dane serving uh, who, who then described it. Um, but uh, if I just want to give an example of, of, mm -hmm. of one of these, uh, I've picked um, an account by um, by a guy who served uh, in the uh, uh, 84th Infantry Regiment, which was one of the uh, sometimes called Danish regiments, which uh, were the regiments that were recruited in Schleswig and therefore had a significant number of Danish soldiers in, within their ranks. Yeah. Uh, and um, what many don't realize is that that uh, two of these Danish regiments took part in the uh, in the uh, attack on Mons in um, in August 1914, which is of course a very uh, famous British battle. Uh, First and I, one. I don't, yeah, exactly. And I don't think that many. Uh, British people today realize that a large chunk of the people who they fought there were actually Danes. Um, so um, this uh, guy writes about uh, the, the the battle as he saw it. Uh, and I want to read you his account. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he writes... One second, I just need to drink some water. Okay. You can cut that, that's cool. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Whenever you're ready. Yeah, sure. Is it okay? Yep. So far? Yep, brilliant. All right, good. All right. He writes, The wild hunt through Belgium stopped on 22 August. We made camp in a small village in front of Mons. The English troops had occupied the city, and the English airmen were in the air to keep track of our movements. In the morning, Sunday the 23rd of August, we felt that something was about to happen. We marched across a large green meadow towards the forest on the other side. There was a farm or something like that. And there were lots of chicken and ducks that we had an appetite for, but we soon got something else to think about. The bullets were already whistling in the treetops, and further, and the further we got, the worse it got. We passed brickworks, in front of which lay rows of workers' houses, and the inhabitants were hiding in the cellars. The town of Mons lies low, and a canal runs before the town. Behind this, there's a street with houses. Up in these, the English had made firing ports. There were no people to be seen, but as we crossed an open field, we were greeted by heavy fire. We were to reinforce the skirmish line that had been sent forward to, before us, but it turned out that they were all either wounded or dead. We later learned that the English were all, uh, all colonial troops, some with 10 years of service behind them. The machine guns sent their storms of lead into our ranks. We were seven from southern Jutland in my section. Our section leader was teacher Peterson from Yeorp. Uh, we were all young reservists who had been mobilized on the 4th of, of August. The first to be wounded in our group was Jörn Mikkelsen from Hamelio. He was shot in the shoulder. Then it was teacher Peterson's turn. He was hit by two bullets in the arm. Then came the turn to Hans Tuft from Jan de Lund. He was hit in the lung. The next was my sideman, Mats Jensen from Hotrup. Uh, he was shot in the leg. We shouted, Mass, stay down. But he wanted to get into cover by a house in front of us. When he got up, he was sadly hit in the head. He fell. Eventually, there were only four of us left. We managed to get to some railway sleepers by the railway, uh, which went into a month. The four of us uh, who escaped this time were Johannes Andersen from Stuling, Peter S. Paulsen from Skorby, Peter Peterson from Reisby, and me. Later, during the Battle of Marne, Johannes Andersen and Peter Peterson were captured by the English. When our artillery finally arrived, the English resistance stopped. We went forward again. In front of us, a turned bridge led across the canal. The bridge was open, but a little German jumped into the canal, swam over it, and closed the bridge. Uh, then the company got going. We led the crossing. The machine guns, which had received us so violently, had been standing on the bridge pillars. Now both men's, men and equipment lay scattered on all sides. It was the first time I had met such strong opposition. It was late in the afternoon, and it was 30 degrees. In the English positions, there were still hot meals, but none of us uh, neither had neither the time nor desire to eat it. Some of the English had jumped into the canal when the German artillery began firing. Some had only their heads above the water, but now they were held up and led into captivity. The wild hunt went on. I witnessed something that I will never forget. The city was set on fire by the shooting. Occasionally, we had to cross the streets running. A small dog came out of a house. 
A soldier hit it with the butt of his rifle, so it howled. Then a woman came out at the door. She wanted to save the dog, but she had a small knife in her hand. Perhaps she had been peeling potatoes. When a paramedic saw the knife, he was so shocked that in his confusion, he pulled out his revolver and shot the woman. It turned out that she was highly pregnant. It was war in all its horror. It's horrible, isn't it? It is, but you have an account that describes a key moment in in the war. Uh, And this is just one of many uh, accounts that describe the same battle. One of the uh, the guys that he mentions, we also have an account of the ones that are wounded. Uh, we also have an account by him. Um, so, so you have quite a lot of accounts on the German side that, that you don't normally see or hear uh, because they're, of course, written in Danish. Um, mm. But um, You also have, don't you, uh, Danes that go over to the Eastern Front? Yeah. we. Uh, they, as I said earlier, they're just everywhere. Mm. Um, and um, just to represent also the Eastern Front in this, uh, I picked one who, who served in uh, in Poland in, in January 1915, a guy called Heming Skoll, and um, he, and he describes how it, how it is. Uh, he, he describes a lot about the feeling of going into battle, uh, and he writes about uh, charging a, an unnamed Russian town. Um, and I really picked this account because it really sheds a, a different light on on the war, uh, the mm-hmm. war in the East. And of course, it also a brilliant uh, account that describes, well, the sounds, the fear, the confusion, the experience of, of such a trench assault. Uh, and um, if I just pick up the story when his comrades are about to go over the top, uh, he writes, um, the silence was overpowering. No one said anything. You discover that you can do an awful lot when you have to. Truly a state in which fear rules. For a moment, you are actually paralyzed by fear. You get completely stiff, can't even turn your head. One feels like a lump of living horror. Behind us, the trenches are filled with even more human material. All reserves are deposited. At one o'clock, everyone must rush forward. An hour before the artillery fire begins, the most terrible artillery concentration I've experienced so far is breaking out. The 21 centimeter mortars participate. Uh, there's this thunder in the air, hollow drones, eerie banks, eerie whispers. In salvos, the grenades from the heavy cannons come howling over us to spread death and destruction over the Russian trenches. And he writes, um, A few comrades run into a small burning town in front of us. We never saw them again, for the city did not become ours. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and um, just the last account from the Slash Week Danes, uh, I've picked one that I, I, I stumbled on a while ago that I really thought was interesting. And it's also picked because it really um, represents what I talked about earlier, that they are in, in some of these very big battles as well, yeah. uh, like some Passchendaele and Cambrai and Arras and all these big ones. And I've picked one um, uh, of a soldier. He writes on the... Uh, just the the letter H uh, after the war in in the 1940s uh, about uh, his time before um, the uh, uh, hill uh, 304 north of Verdun in mm-hmm. in the spring of 1916, uh, which was a, a key point that uh, that some of the uh, the Danish regiments fought had. Uh, and he writes. <clears throat> It was a spring morning in 1916 at 3 or 4 near Verdun. We had attacked without artillery preparation and had been beaten back. Everyone sought cover as best he could. For now, a hellish storm broke over us. The French put out all the explosives he possessed over our trench. Both light and heavy shells exploded on the edge of the trench, while shrapnel and howitzers sought to get us down in the bottom of the trench. It was during this period that the first steel helmets were introduced, so far only experimentally, but one man in each section was forced to put such heavy, new-fashioned things on his head. When no one in my section would voluntarily change from the relatively light pickle to the heavy and inconvenient steel pot, my pickle was taken from me, and the new monster was pressed down on my head. I growled, and the comrades laughed at me. However, the pot helped save my life. During the terrible artillery barrage, I crawled into a dugout, where I assumed I'd be relatively safe. However... A shell exploded and the parapet 
uh, on the parapet and pushed the earth down over me, so my legs were buried. I slipped the baron bayonet out of the sheath and ducked my legs free again. But just as I was about to crawl out of the hole, an even heavier shell exploded above me, and now I was completely buried, with the exception of the head and the left arm. It was a terrible position I was in. The masses of earth pressed terribly on my legs, stomach, and chest, and the only thing I could do was to hold the steel helmet in front of my face with my left hand. I fainted, but a new explosion brought me back to consciousness again. Thus, it alternated a few times between unconsciousness and consciousness, and in the clear moment, I was preparing to die. However, once again, the urge for self-preservation awoke in me, and I screamed, screamed from fear of death, without even believing that anyone would hear me in this hellish noise. And who would venture out in this stormy weather? The trench was now almost level, and every second I could expect a deadly piece of steel. Again I screamed, and now screamed my wife's name out through the rain of shells and noise. It was her I thought of in this supposed moments of death. We had been married for a couple of years, and our thoughts were always with each other, so I thought of nothing but her. And therefore, I also shouted out her name in these moments when death was near. And now comes the marvel of this incident. Quite clearly, I heard my wife's voice. Yes, my dear, I'm coming. The dear voice had a wonderful effect on me. I became quite calm and at the same time was quite sure that she would help me and that I would not die this time. Immediately, I heard voices nearby, a sergeant and a paramedic trying to dig me out. However, they only had a small field spade, which didn't do much. While the paramedic crawled back to, for, a, for a larger shovel and a pick, the sergeant stayed with me. It cost him his life. He was hit by a large piece of a grenade. When the paramedic returned, the sergeant was dead and I lay unconscious. They were a couple of heroes, both he who died and he who dug me free. Wow. Yeah. So what, what I think is interesting about a lot of these accounts is, is that we get a different view of, of the German side of the war. Uh, we, we get a more human uh, side of it. And, and, and you can hear, in, for example, in this guy, uh, he's obviously a, a Dane who is not very keen on fighting for Germany, but he mm -hmm. still uh, describes uh, his, his fellow uh, soldiers who are most likely Germans as being heroes. Um, uh, and 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 you can also hear in in the way he describes the scene with the uh, receiving the steel helmets, which you could also say is is a key moment in the war. Uh, this, yeah, this change uh, which is uh, played out here, but but you also get the the comradeship and 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 the way that their interaction that they laugh at each other and and this and and that's why I think these are a great source to to portray uh, the other side of the war, if you will. Yeah, I think as well, once you're there and you're in the middle of it, it doesn't matter a damn what your ethnicity no. is. You're in it together, aren't you? Yeah, uh, and and you, you hear that a lot. I mean, most of the conflicts, they play out behind the line, of course. Uh, the conflicts with the uh, with the German officers or, or, or whatever between the Danish uh, soldiers, they're not allowed to speak Danish. Some of them are... Uh, most of them are not allowed leave uh, because mm -hmm. because there's a fear that they will they will escape to Denmark. Um, so, so there are a lot of conflicts of that. But of course, all of this mostly takes place behind the front. Yeah, there's no time for it when you're in the front lines. No, of course not. But we so we talked about the Schles Schleswig Schleswig. Schleswig yeah. yeah, we talked about those poor guys who were sort of. Uh, ramroded into the war, weren't they? They didn't yeah. really have a choice based on where they were living. But there are lots of Danes all over the place uh, who are there because they want to be. Now, we've already talked about France. We've already talked about Verdun. But tell us about... You've got one guy, haven't you, um, that you've translated some stuff for that went off and joined mm. the French Foreign Legion. Yeah, so so if you were a Dane living in Denmark and wanted to take part of the war... Uh, which many people did, and I, I think this is something that we don't really understand much, that the war is really the thing at the time. And a lot of, for a lot of young men, this is really, in, in Denmark, for example, this is really an opportunity missed. This is a great thing that will happen in their lifetime, and they're not going to be part of it. Uh, so, of course, some people will try to join, and, and it, your, your best choice for that is uh, the French Foreign Legion. 
because they're the ones mo most likely to take foreigners, of course. So um, now at the outbreak of the war, um, there were of course some Danes who were already serving and they didn't have much of a choice in the matter. Uh, people who have joined the, the, the Legion before the war. Uh, but then there are also those who, who, who joined for a range of different reasons and adventure being a pretty important part of it. Somebody just wanted to be part of the war, as I said, uh, and they felt that they were missing out. And then, of course, there were some who saw this as an opportunity to strike back at Germany uh, and revenge 1864 that we mentioned mm -hmm. before. Uh, um, that's a big part for some people as well. Um, and you also see that so, so, some Danes had uh, ancestors who had fought uh, in the Franco-Prussian War. Yep. Uh, after 1864, they joined the French army to fight the Germans again in 1864. Um, but yeah, you have a, a really strange mix of people. Uh, amongst the ones that we, we know of, uh, you find the uh, receptionist at Angleterre, which is the, the most famous five-star hotel in Copenhagen. And you find the waffle maker at the uh, Duhaus Park, which is the world's uh, oldest operating amusement park just north mm -hmm. of the capital. So you have a lot of strange people. Um, now, to represent this, as you said, I've picked one man. Um, his name is uh, Ulysses Eliasson. Uh, and before the war, he was uh, a trained uh, blacksmith. But he worked at, as a waiter, both for his brother, uh, who had a restaurant in a town called uh, Felixwerk, and for his father, who owned the Damhuskron, or Damhus Inn, which is a very famous inn just outside of Copenhagen. Um, and it's still there now. It's actually, from where I'm recording this, it's just uh, like a 20-minute walk from here. Oh, right. um, yeah, and uh, it's actually also where my grandparents celebrated their 14th wedding anniversary. So a bit of a... A personal connection too. Um, mm -hmm. Now, uh, Jules uh, is an interesting character in many ways. Uh, in one of his letters, he he writes, uh, "There are many other things I'm not good at, but military that I can do." I think that sums him up very well. Uh, much like uh, Ernst Junger, who is of course famous for for the book Storm of Steel, uh, Jules is a man who who didn't necessarily see the war as something bad. Uh, he was one who really seemed to enjoy it, um, the adventure of it, the danger, uh, the character building, that that sort of thing. And and while he was fighting in the, in a French uniform as a Dane, he also had a, a strong sense of duty. Um, yeah, and an ongoing occurring theme in his letters is is the wish for a medal and for promotion. And he's also quick to criticize others who thinks who he thinks are cowards, especially. If he sees uh, Danes in the Legion that behaves like cowards, so he, he's a strange man. But um, in in a way, while while this doesn't really seem very appealing qualities, maybe today, yeah. uh, it's really impossible not to like him when you read his letters, because he has a, a really great sense of humor and a very boyish naivety that really shines through all of his letters. Yeah, and yeah, I should mention this is from a collection of letters uh, sent to his uh, family. Um, during the war, and some of them are actually published in Danish newspapers during the war. Um, yeah, but um, his his writings are also a little strange, uh, and sometimes translating them are, are not that easy because they they're really uh, written very much like you speak, and and it's these long convoluted sentences with strange choices of words and some rather odd punctuations at the time uh, and he also tries to make up when he doesn't know the word in danish a french term he just makes it up in danish <laughs> this is the guy you were complaining about isn't it <laughs> oh yeah he's a really bad one uh there are some of them that are really difficult to translate <laughs> this one was really difficult yeah but um so, so some of it might sound a bit weird but mm -hmm. it also sounds weird in Danish, let me assure you of that. But you want everyone to know it's him that's yeah. the weirdo, not you. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. <laughs> I'm pushing the blame to a man a hundred years ago. It's fine, he can't yeah. argue. Uh, so, <laughs> exactly. Uh, now, in uh, early 1915, he travels to Britain to find work as a blacksmith, but he once again ends up uh, as a waiter in a London hotel. And he's not really happy about this, so he, he decides to travel to Paris uh, with uh, three other Danes and volunteer for the Legion. 
Uh, and I just want to read you some excerpts from, from the letter home he sends on the 18th of April, uh, 1950, just after enlisting. Uh, and again, this, his letters are very long and a bit weird at times. Uh, but yeah, anyway, here we go. He writes, Dear parents and siblings, well, I suppose you'll get a, quite the scare uh, when you hear where I am. I'm in France and I've become a soldier. It's very interesting, I, I assure you. But there's so much I could use and so much I'd like to buy. So please send me a hundred crowns. I'll pay, pay them back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll pay them back, but please send them at once because I don't have any. The trip was expensive and everything is uh, terribly expensive. I hope you'll send them uh, as I really need them. And will you send me a Danish French dictionary and a Danish French encyclopedia so I can learn to speak French? I already know a few words, but not that many. Here are all sorts of people, Greeks, Romanians, Swiss, Swedes, Spaniards, and Italians and Jews. Most of them are rough fellows. But you must understand that they are not scared as all of them are volunteers. I can't understand why all countries don't go, war, go to war against Germany. Well, you'll hear more from me soon. Please send me the book, two books and the money so I'll ha have them when we leave, perhaps for the front. Yeah, so, so um, I love it. <laughs> yeah, he, he's I've joined the army character. now. Can I have some money? <laughs> exactly, and it's it, this is the first thing he writes um, to his parents about this and his siblings, of course. Um, yeah, uh, and yeah, we can't really. There are a lot of letters, so we can't really uh, um, go into them all. But let me summarize a bit of what happens to him. He's in Paris for a short time, then he goes to to Orleans for training. Uh, which is he describes as hard. Um, he describes some of the different legionnaires he meets and com complains about some of them, uh, especially some of the Danes he meets. Um, and he's also constantly begging for money and cigarettes. Uh, and then in, in June, he's sent to the front, uh, 1915. And uh, his first letter from the trenches, he, he writes, Dear parents and siblings, well, I can assure you... Uh, sorry. Let me start that again. Dear parents and siblings, well, I can assure you this is an adventure I'm on now. I arrived alone, but in the morning when we were drinking coffee in the section uh, to which I'd been assigned, suddenly a bearded fellow said, Sofafen, meaning bloody hell in Danish, uh, as he dropped his coffee. I then knew he was a countryman. He'd not been in Denmark for seven years and had been a soldier since August 2nd, 1914. I'm uh, lying in the first trench, 60 meters from the Germans. The bullets whistle above our heads all day. The other Dane is 26 year, years old. We're standing guard together and having a good time. Around half past four in the morning, when I was looking through the embrasure, something suddenly splashed my, me directly in the eye. A bullet had hit just inches from the hole, sending sparks into my face. Be careful, said a corporal. I grabbed my rifle and fired all eight rounds against the place I thought the shots had come from. I hate the bastards, and we all do. Yeah, so you, you see this ongoing theme is, is his hatred for Germans. Um, mm. uh, and it's, it really goes all the way th uh, through. And he, he sometimes comes across, across as quite rough and cold. Uh, but, but then again, uh, at other times, you really have a, a softer side to him. Um, uh, and it, it's, what, it's this mix uh, of the two personalities that really make, make him interesting. And, and sometimes he sort of switches between them from sentence to sentence. Uh, and in just to illustrate this, in, in one of uh, the letters he writes to his younger sister, he writes, uh, Dear Inga, which is the name of his sister, when the war is over, I'll return as a lieutenant and bring you, Julie and Frida, down here to France to show the caves and kilometers of long trenches where we, we have lived and fought. Uh, I'll make sure to wash well and remove the lice, comb my hair and co cut it short. I'm standing directly in front of the Germans while writing. Once in a while, I'll look through the embrasure and see if some German needs a shot of powder. Long live Denmark, France, and Scandinavia. And then in another letter, uh, similarly, he writes, uh, you write that I must come home for Christmas, uh, but dear Tule, which is uh, another sister, mm -hmm. I can't, no matter how much I want to, uh, but I'll send you all the Christmas presents. Uh, you'll each get a ring of uh, aluminium made from pieces of German shells. But next Christmas, you'll see Uncle Julius come home as Santa Claus with his pockets full of German pickelhaubes, Emperor Wilhelm's mustache, guns and rifles, and all kinds of other toys we have here. 
when you really think about it, humans are some strange creations. Here, grown men run around uh, at, and dig uh, ramparts, jump around, play with rifles and cannons, just like little children do. The only difference is that when grown-ups kill, uh, but that doesn't make them any smarter, only a thousand times dumber and more idiotic. I love, yeah. I'm just fixated on the idea that he would have the Kaiser's moustache in his pocket. Exactly. You have yeah. all this. <laughs> he has a, a great way of describing these things and a great sense of humor that just runs through, despite, you know, he he's also quite uh, brutalist at, at times, and he, he obviously doesn't really think much of it. Uh, some of the things that he writes uh, to, to his... Um, to his, to his mother, for example. You write brutal scenes of combat to his mother where he's in imminent danger. And it, I can't help but think that most people would have shined that up <laughs> to sound a little less scary. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he uh, the first big battle he takes part in is, is, is uh, the Second Battle of Champagne in September 1915. Uh, but just uh, as an example of, uh, of the fighting, I've picked one from a little later. Um, mm that he writes in March 1916, uh, after he's moved to a regular French uh, regiment. Um, to t- and he takes part in, in the opening stages of the, the Battle of Verdun uh, in March 1916. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite long uh, and was very difficult to translate again, so bear with me. Uh, but he writes, We jumped up like steel springs, grabbed the rifle in front of us, filled the magazine and fixed the bayonet. Hundreds of shrapnel... Uh, exploded in the air and shells in the earth. There were only a few hundred uh, meters to the first line of trenches, and out there cracked thousands, yes, millions of rifle shots. We were in this hell until three or four in the afternoon when the Germans broke through. Those of ours who were still alive came rushing back to our line, pursued by an overpowering enemy. When they were around 100 meters from us, the command fire sounded, and from the mouth of thousands of fresh rifles flew a rain of bullets. I'm sure that that many of them went mad because they couldn't turn back as they were almost com- almost pressed forward by the ones in the rear. They reached our barbed wire, and some got through, but then they couldn't do any more. The entire field in front of us was a sea of people, whining, howling, and screaming. Mercilessly, the shells exploded amongst them, tore and ripped them apart. When the newspaper would write that uh, in the end, you couldn't see if it was rocks, arms, legs, and tree trunks being thrown into the air, then it's true. Now they started running back like madmen. When you saw one uh, who, who could still run, you aimed, and I must have lost all emotions in that moment, because never before have I been able to aim the rifle so calmly as I did then. The rifle rest, rested on the parapet in front of me. I pressed the butt into my shoulder. The eyes circled around the sights, and when I caught a German, bang. I didn't notice what was happening around me. Uh, But thinking back, I remembered that every time one fell, I had a smile of triumph on my face. So you have a a brutal honesty about how he feels about Germans and and, and killing. Uh, And when you study the war you often find that you know as some some other historians have also said that you rarely find descriptions of somebody actually killing somebody yeah it's that's true it's like else. glossed over yeah. yeah exactly it's the other person next to them that are killed or kill somebody uh it's rarely that you find somebody like this and and this way he actually admits to to feeling happy when he kills uh is is uh, a bit uh, strange yeah, I think I talked about it on another podcast. I don't think mm. it was with you. There's an English guy like this, and I, I can't for the life of me remember who it was, but it just so happened that who we were talking to was researching him as well. And he's a, a bit of a an off-colour uh, scientist who mm-hmm. ends up um, in India and taking Indian nationality. But again, he he takes utter joy in ending yeah. people's lives. He thinks it's great fun. Um, and it those is. guys are out there, and they're on all sides. And of I course. think some of it's just a a response to the idea that that's your job now isn't it yeah i think you act like you enjoy it then i think so and 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 it's clear uh from also some of the other ones that i i i uh, i read before you know that that he really has a hatred for germany he he feels that everybody should go against him He, he feels that this is you know 
uh, Denmark's fight as well against the Germans, the arch enemy. Uh, so, so, so there, there's something understandable about it. And of course, these are all written at the time, shortly after the action. Mm. Uh, so, so they're not, you know, watered down after the war. How everything fell, uh, and 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 you get a, a, a different kind of view of it. Now, I want to continue the same story, just uh, skipping a bit. Uh, yeah. Following a short pause in the battle, the the German uh, attack is then renewed, and 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 Jules right. Uh, we fired, fired, fired. The machine guns spewed their fire, but they they reached the wire over piles of their own comrades, and there they hung like flies on a on a flycatcher. They crawled, tumbled, fell, and threw themselves into our wire. A big devil got close to me. He raised the butt of his rifle to crack over my skull, but a long spike possibly a bayonet it's a bit strange what he writes here mm. he calls it a spike uh, went into his stomach causing him to fall on top of me and i in turn fell down in the bottom of the trench in his last seconds he had his large hands around my throat and he was lying on top of me so i couldn't move my right hand was fumbling at my putties i managed to get out my dagger and get a hold of it and then it went back and forth four or five times into his body and his face so the blood ran off my sleeves and over my clothes and my face. But then his grip loosened and I could breathe again. I tumbled him over to the side and stood up. It was getting dark and above me, the soldiers were rushing forward. My eyes were dizzy and I thought it was the Germans overrunning our line. He had suddenly squeezed my throat tight. I'd almost passed out and I couldn't sink straight. But I recovered little by little and then I saw that it was the African troops from our division. Yeah, it's like you say, it's not watered down, is it? No, it isn't. And and these these are the kind of letters that he writes to his his family, his sisters, his brother, his his mother. Uh, so so you you get a really honest account. Now now he survives Verdun, um, and later that year he also takes part in the Battle of the Somme. But here his his log runs out. Uh, however, and he's he's last seen by another Danish volunteer doing an attack on uh, the fourth of July. Uh, and he was reported missing in action along with three other Danes um, in in mid July. Uh, initially, nobody knew if he, he'd been killed or captured, but nothing has been heard of him since. So we have to presume that he was he was killed in action at that point. Yeah, and they're remarkably honest letters, aren't they? I mean, like I just there's a striking resemblance to a total difference to uh, Arthur Reese Davids, the pilot, when you see the mm. letters he writes to his younger sister and like he'll write her five pages of nonsense about a pretty little bird sitting on a tree mm. talking to him and doesn't mention one bit about getting in an aeroplane and going shooting at Germans yeah. and it's it's all shielding um, the fact his letters are constantly shielding apart from to the other sister they shield them from the reality of it but mm. he doesn't do that at all how old is he? I don't know. It, it, it is not recounted anywhere how old he actually he is. He seems very uh, young to me. I'm sure I could find out if we went yeah. into the archives and found his uh, his um, his status from about that time. I mean, he he's a trained blacksmith at the time, so I'm guessing he's in his early twenties. Yeah, he sounds uh, young to me. Yeah, he does. And and as I said, his his le- he's he's not a learned man. I mean, his letters are really not not very well written. Um, but uh, but but it gives a very unique view of the war, uh, and I think he he's a fascinating character because you have this this naivety, you have this this joking side mixed with these absolutely bloody scenes and this this streak of you know happiness at at killing uh, the enemy that that we are normally spared in most accounts. Yeah, I think what's really interesting is you also found one uh, serving, well, I suppose technically British, so, but Imperial troops. You mm. found one in the Australian forces as well, haven't you? Yeah, I mean, there, besides uh, the Foreign Legion volunteers, there are a number of Dan- Danes who also manage uh, to join other Allied armies. Uh, and uh, while some of them we don't really have any accounts of, like Russia and I'm sure other places as well. Belgium, we have, we know that there are a few who actually serve as officers uh, here and there, uh, one in Africa in particular. Uh, but a, but a few managed to enlist in the British Army. Um, but but uh, they were more reluctant to take foreigners. Uh, most were, who tried were rejected. Um, Possibly. On the other hand, if you happen to be down in Australia and New Zealand, because I know Holmes and I found yeah. a Norwegian whose ship had docked exactly. um, 
in New Zealand who just jumped into the New Zealand forces. Is that what your guy did? Yeah, yeah. Um, there, there, no, the, the guy that I, I, I picked, he he, uh, he arrives um, just before the war and is working there. He's not a he's not a uh, a citizen yet, but but you see it a lot. I mean, we we have three Danes who are quite famous uh, because they all won the uh, Victoria Cross. Uh, fighting for the British, uh, or yeah, I guess the British. Uh, while one was in the actual British Army, and one was uh, in the Australian Army, and one was in the Canadian Army. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, the, the way they get in is always a bit, a bit interesting. Uh, one, the guy who, who served in the British Army, he, his name is uh, Percy Hansen. Um, he won the Victoria Cross at uh, Gallipoli, but he was he was born to Danish parents in South Africa and grew up in Britain, went to Eden, and that was sort of his ticket into the army, if you will, that he had enough to do uh, with 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 Britain, uh, even though he wasn't actually a citizen at the time. Um, then Canadians and Australians were generally more willing to take foreigners. Um, uh, one one that we have that I mentioned before, the Victoria Cross. Uh, when is uh, young Christian Jensen who won the Victoria Cross in 1917, uh, um, but he had already been uh, in Australia in, in in 1909 and became a naturalized British subject in 1914 to join the army in in, in 1915. Uh, and then the only we actually have an account by one of them, uh, the, a guy called Thomas Dinesen, mm-hmm. um, who uh, he lived in Denmark when war broke out, so that was a bit different. Um, but he was desperate uh, to to fight, and he tried to join the British Army, but was rejected. He then tried to join the French Army, but was rejected. He then traveled to America in 1917 uh, to join the American Army when they uh, joined the war, but he was rejected. Uh, and then, I suppose, they're lost because he was taken on by, by Canada, finally, and won the VC in France in August 1918. Um, and just a side note, he's, uh, he was the brother of um, famous Danish writer Karen Blixen uh, who is famously played by Meryl Streep in the movie Out of Africa Ah, oh, yeah. that's Karen Blixen Yeah, he was uh, her brother um, and there are uh, monuments to all these men in Denmark now uh, but yeah uh, it's almost impossible to guess how many actually managed to get into the Commonwealth forces uh, and estimates very greatly but, but for this uh, I've not pick a VC winner, winner as information is available. Yeah. Uh, instead, I've chosen to focus on um, a normal guy, if you will, uh, a guy called Nils Grenfell Stevenson, um, who was a deputy manager at a cigar factory in Melbourne in Australia. And um, he volunteered for service in the Australian for- forces uh, on the 18th of August, 1914. Uh, after Denmark declared neutrality um, and he was sure that he wasn't going to be called up in his homeland. Um, and he had previously served 14 months in the Danish army and wanted to become an officer, but re- was rejected because he was colorblind. Um, yeah, but uh, still, joining wasn't easy for him. Um, and while it details a cloud in mystery... Uh, he admits in one letter to his brother that he wasn't actually allowed to serve as he hadn't been in the country long enough to become a naturalized British subject. Uh. Uh, however, he writes he writes this, uh, with a bit of cheekiness and the help of a government official, I was accepted. I love it, cheekiness. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so his service record, uh, which you can read online at the National Archives, actually clearly states that he had somehow managed to present naturalization papers when joining up uh, even though and in wax crayon yeah exactly yeah uh, <laughs> yeah anyway he uh he was assigned to the seventh battalion of, of the aif and following training he was sent to egypt and later in uh, april 1915 he was uh, sent to gallipoli um and in his letters uh, to his siblings especially his sister uh, which is almost primary so i was here uh showed that he he likely joined the war primarily to see the world. Uh, and he sometimes refers to himself as a tourist. Um, and this makes his letters interesting because he likes to write long passages about um, the things that he find curious and, and interesting. Like uh, he'll write about 
Cairo and the hustle and bustle of the the, the bazaars and rides between the pyramids. We also have a uh, a photo of him uh, in front of the Sphinx and the pyramids. Um, um, and really, if it were if it wasn't for the uniform, you couldn't really tell that he wasn't just a just a tourist. Um, anyway, he. Um, uh, he also, when he, when he arrives in, in in France in 1916, he will he will make note of like curious sites, like women working as tram drivers or working at the railways. Um, but yeah, um, there's also uh, there's also during his letters uh, as, a sense that he's changing uh, by the war, that this view is changing, and and in 1915, uh, sorry, six. Sorry, 1917, he writes to his brother, Admittedly, I'm a different man now, a whole lot more serious. And first uh, of all, I have learned to appreciate life and thank God that I live it all. So so there's a bit different from, from the earlier ones where he, he describes himself as a tourist. Yeah, um, it's no fun anymore. Exactly. Um, and he also exhibits quite a bit of homesickness in some of his letters. Uh, he, he's very excited to meet uh, other Danish volunteers at times. And he also mentions that he wishes that he could go home to Denmark uh, and that he would much rather go home to Denmark uh, than Australia if he's allowed after the war. Um, anyway, so while he's both in, in Gallipoli and in and, and France, uh, I've chosen to, to focus on on the five letters he sends for, from Gallipoli as we already have covered France. Um, yeah. So we don't know much about his first service at Gallipoli. Uh, his first letter uh, home is from uh, from the 15th of June, 1915, mm-hmm. uh, while he's sick in the hospital uh, in Mudras. Uh, and it's addressed to his sister, and it re- reads, Dear sister, I've been sent to the hospital sick. My stomach hurts. It's nice to get, get away from the shooting. I so long to read a Danish magazine. And so we know he's already been in action at this point, um, but but then it picks up when he's sent back to the front. Uh, and this is the next letter uh, dated from the 22nd of July, 1915. He writes, I, I assume you've been reading about our fi- fighting in Turkey in the magazines. It's hard to describe all the terrible things happening here that you would hardly be able to imagine. We are very few left in my company and I've lost my uh, all of my friends and it is getting on my nerves. But it does not help. Uh, we are fighting for our right, and it helps us move forward. I'm still an orderly, but now, uh, but not for my old captain. He was hit, poor fellow, the first Sunday we landed here. I've been in the trenches for two weeks, a long time. If we could only see the Turks, it would be fine. But for uh, two weeks, we saw only the trenches about 50 to 200 yards away. Uh, but the grenades, they're terrible, especially the great howitzers. It is impossible to fight cover against them, uh, for they make great holes four feet deep, and all who are near them are buried alive, even the strongest men's nerves give in. We can hear them coming, and waiting for them to explode is the worst. The climate here is beautiful, only two days of rain rain for three months, but it is sometimes very hot. Uh, When we are not in the trenches, we can have salt water bath every day. The Turks uh, have fought fair so far. But a lot can happen before we reach Constantinople, and we will fight hard for it. But the Turks must be defeated, and with them the Germans. And we, the Allies, will do what it costs. I have to finish now. We are not only allowed to use one sheet. Yeah, so you see, during this time, you also see a a change that at this point, he somehow still has some hope of, of actually reaching Constantinople, which will... Uh, will disappear very quickly yeah, exactly because of course uh, shortly after this letter you know you have this, the start of the the august offensive um and his next letter is dated just be just days before that on august 3rd and he's he's uh he's writing we're preparing the turks for hell but they're still biting i'm uh, sorry for you because this letter will be the last for a long time because we'll be up in the trenches in a couple of days I do not know for how long. After having a respite of a couple of weeks behind the trenches, uh, we will therefore only get uh, the usual, sorry, you will therefore only get the usual, I'm fine, but I'm glad as long as I can send you that. A German airplane dropped bombs on our bivouac the other morning. I'm happy that sweet Lily, his niece, uh, is praying for me. It seems to help me get through and give me hope. Uh, 
bring her my best wishes and kiss her. Thank God they have not yet, yet used poison gas, but if they do, we are prepared for it. Each soldier has a gas mask to wear. I shall not be saddened when there is peace. And then during a, a, on a short period of rest on August 18th, he, he writes his sister again. So, so a, a few weeks after the first one. Uh, we now have a little rest of 48 hours. Uh, we really need that too. It's absolutely hell up in the trenches. The smell alone from hundreds of corpses that we cannot bury is unbearable and is enough to make a man sick of war. And the Turks, the beasts, are only 5 to 10 meters away from us. So 48 hours up there is more than enough. It's a wonder to me that I'm not hurt yet. Bullets, bombs, and shrapnels fly around my ears, but always miss me. My mood is excellent, and I myself feel uh, happily healthy and well, and look forward to two, three weeks of rest in dear Denmark. How is Lily? I'm so happy to know that she has not yet forgotten me. I'm so jealous of my bro brother. Yeah, it's okay uh, to see the death of innocence as these letters yeah, go exactly. on. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, uh, but but it, it's just he he goes through this whole change then, and, and while there's still a little hope, I guess, <laughs> in the next letter that he writes to his brother that that they would actually reach Constantinople, it's a little more pessimistic. Uh, he writes here. Um, Life here in the trenches is unspeakably, unspeakably monotonous. We occupy the same trenches for, for the fourth month running. Where I've been for the last three weeks, I unconquered tur Turkish trenches, and the beasts are no more than one and a half to two meters from us at several points, and there's plenty of bombing. Being at war nowadays is the same as living like a rat. Everything is under the earth. Our sleeping places and connection uh, uh, graves. Sorry trenches he, he writes it as, as graves i've tried mm -hmm. to correct most of them <laughs> but uh yeah um the the war scene is mightily under it, the war scene is a mighty underground labyrinth if you lose your way in one of the tunnels it will take you an hour and a hundred questions to find your way again i hope to be in constantinople soon but it's slow going it's a bit long for a tourist to stop for four months in the same spot I often think about when this slaughter must end, uh, but there's much, there isn't much hope of that happening the next six months. The Germans must be f defeated first and rendered harmless, and that is the great goal we are all striving for. Yeah, so you see that now it's a bit... <laughs> yeah. He's a bit more uh, skeptic that he's now been there for a long, long time and they haven't really gotten anywhere. And of course... Um, as we know, the the campaign is is not going to go better from from that point on. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, now I'm skipping a little bit. Uh, well, he's actually skipping. We don't really have any any um, letters from from the period until uh, December, when he um, when he is finally off uh, Gallipoli, and he, he describes the evacuation just days before. Uh, this letter is dated uh, the 22nd of December. Um, and he writes, well, that was the end of the war in the Dardanelles. We are now all back at Lemnos. Uh, that's why we weren't allowed to send any postcards. It was very interesting. None of us knew anything about the fact that uh, we all had to leave until two days before it happened. You can understand how colossal a work it was and how careful we had to be so that the Turks wouldn't be warned that we wanted to run away. We all had our boots tied around our old, uh, around with old blankets and racks so that we, they wouldn't hear us. You must remember that in several places, the enemy was just a few meters away from us. And if only the slightest thing had been revealed, it would have meant the death of thousands of us. Well, well, there are a hundred more things I would like to tell, but it will have to wait until the war is over. We've been ordered not to divulge everything. The most important thing is that we can now keep Christmas in peace. Our rifles are designed to fire a single shot uh, each hour. Many thanks to your sister for all your letters. And don't forget to thank Lily a thousand times for a Christmas greeting. It was the best Christmas present I could get. Well, at least he got off of there alive. He did. Uh, and he actually also survived the war, but uh, he didn't get off all that easy because in yeah. 1917, uh, while fighting in France, he was hospitalized uh, with shell shock uh, and was later sent back to Australia. Now, we don't really know what happened to him after that. We lose track of him after he's, uh, he's sent back uh, to Australia. Um, 
We'll but, have to uh, see if we can get by, an Australian to track him down. Yeah, maybe. I mean, judging by his letters, he likely returned to Denmark uh, after being discharged. And hopefully he lived a long and happy life. Um, but we don't know. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, yeah. We've gone quite long already, but I don't want to deny people because we've got one more group to talk about, haven't we? And yes. that is inevitably all of the Danes that had emigrated to America. So what happens, obviously happens, when America enters the war in 1917? Yeah, it's a group that that we don't hear much about. Uh, I think most Danes don't even think about them. But yeah, of course, uh, the Danes who, who emigrated um, either before or during the war uh, would find themselves, a lot of them, fighting uh, in the uh, AEF in 1917-18. And we can't really know uh, how many it is. Uh, some say around 30,000 Danish-Americans served, but of course it depends on how you define who is a Danish-American, who is an American already. Uh, for, for, for me, I've been trying to focus on, on the first and second generation Americans mm-hmm. in my study of it, or the, the ones that have lived in uh, in these um, distinctive Danish enclaves, uh, mostly in the Midwest, where where, where the prim the the primary language was uh, Danish and churches were Danish and there were Danish traditions and places like um, there's uh, Asco in Minnesota and Elkhorn in Iowa, yeah. uh, which are these Danish towns in America. Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, the the um, war actually had a great impact on these people um, because. In many ways, these Danish towns turned American during the war uh, to display patriotism. Uh, and if you read the Danish American press, uh, the newspaper that's, that came out, they're always like encouragement for for starting to celebrate uh, like the Fourth of July instead of the Fifth of June, which is the Constitution Day in Denmark. So in a way, this this changed during the war, and and this distinctive Danish uh, mentality was almost wiped out in many of these places uh, and everybody just became American uh, as they were desperately trying to, to lose the, the sometimes not very favorable term of being a hyphenated American. So like a Danish American, or German American mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, yeah. Um, and you also find interesting articles uh, and that I think we should, read out now like from this one from a Danish American newspaper in May 1917 so just a month after America ended the war and in, it's important to note that this is before uh, conscription is declared in, in America uh, and it's uh, presented as an anonymous letter to the editor and addressed to the boys and signed by someone calling themselves one of your girls uh, so you already kind of know where this is going yep okay yeah let's give this a listen boys I am wondering how many of you have a great, big, proud feeling these days, because you are Americans. I have been anxiously but hopefully watching to see some of your names added to the list of brave, loyal American boys who have shown grit and true spirit enough to join our Army or Navy when President Wilson called for volunteers. I have heard of one only. I know that some are preparing to give their country their very best support, But I know, too, that a great many of we Danish people are still not aroused. We Danes are slow to be up and doing if we cannot see that the results of the deed are going to be of a certain benefit to our own little group in particular. We do lack the big, broad view that should belong to every American citizen, especially in times as serious as these are. I wonder, how many of us can truly say, I am not a Dane, I'm an American, Boys, we girls are almost brokenhearted to think of the possibility of your having to enter the terrible war. But rather than hear that, the Americans who hail from Denmark are slaggards or indifferent. Rather than that, we beg of you on our knees to sail for France tomorrow. Although we should know that you would be set before the very mouths of the enemy's cans. So, uh, yeah, I'm smelling a rat. Are you? Yeah, it doesn't really sound like a, a real person. And, uh, it sounds like a uh, middle-aged man sat there and signed exactly, it. Exactly, and tried to give somebody, girls, a, yeah. somebody uh, a bad feeling. But yeah, despite what you might think from reading something like this, there's no indication that Danes were any slower to, to join up than, than any other Americans. Uh, in fact, the first Danish-American who fell in combat already did so in 1917 at Passchendaele while serving in the Canadian forces. 
uh, like many Americans did, they who just crossed the border, didn't they? Cross the borders, yeah, mm. exactly. Um, now I've chosen to um, focus here on a first generation immigrant soldier uh, called Alpha Nielsen. Uh, who immigrated to the United States with two brothers in 1915 uh, from the Danish island of Mors, so during the war. So this is one of the examples of somebody who actually were able to travel during the war. Mm -hmm. Uh, And he wrote an absolutely wonderful account in Danish of his wartime service after the war. Uh, And besides both being well-written and incredibly detailed, uh, about many aspects of his time in France, it's, it's also very reflective and very honest um, now he's a volunteer, but he absolutely did not like the war. Uh, and as we'll see, he really regretted joining up uh, once he arrived at the front. And perhaps because he's a uh, relatively new American, uh, his approach to the war is like many other American accounts of, of war in general, I think. It's almost completely devoid of patriotism or, or this American exceptionalism, exceptionalism if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, What's more, he doesn't really shy away from criticizing the behavior of of his fellow soldiers at times uh, when he sees it. And I just want to give you one example here. Uh, he writes about a fellow man that he chose to name Jim. Um, he writes, one of our signal men uh, was what we called hard-boiled. The death and suffering he saw around him did not touch him. He knew so many swear words that he could swear incessantly for several minutes without s- repeating a single one of the words. I want to call him Jim but that's not his real name. At noon that day, the infantry occupied the plantations around the chicken coops. Jim and I were on our way up to the line, each with two carrier pigeons. On the way up, we met quite a few uh, prisoners, maybe a hundred men. Like a flock of sheep, they were being driven back by two infantrymen. I was some distance ahead of Jim and reached one of the trenches that our infantry had just taken. The trench was completely abandoned, for they were still dead and wounded. The infantry had advanced further. I jumped over the parapet and down into the trench and stood face to face with a wounded German soldier. He could not be more than 18 years old and should be in school rather than in the trenches. He was thin and pale. The ugly gray German infantry uniform hung in folds around this boy. His iron helmet was apparently too large and heavy for his thin neck. He leaned back. He pressed one hand to the chest Uh, which was red with blood. The other he reached for the clouds. His lips moved, but no sound came from him. There was a look of silent prayer in his eyes. I hurried past him, in a way ashamed of having penetrated into the loneliness of a dying man. There are times on the battlefield when a man wants to be alone with his thoughts. I heard a shout, ran back, and there stood Jim with his bayonet through the chest of the boy, who looked at me with those pleading eyes that have ever followed me after I was injured a second time and came back to the hospital. I had seen men slaughtered before, but the sight of the boy with a bayonet through his chest and a face as pale as a human can have and then still be alive was so appalling. Much later, I asked him if it was not wrong. It was a dying man. Is it not what we are here for? Was his answer. Jim stuck the bayonet through a German soldier who was half sitting up against some pieces of wood uh, with the pack on his back and with his hand clustered around the rifle. Jim let him get the bay in it several times. And after a particular powerful blow, the German fell over. Strangely, the damned German was sitting there with his eyes closed. I thought it was false alarm, but I saw that he was already at St. Peter's Gate, begging to be let in. After all, what was mutual permission for pater- fraternal uh, mutilation? Jim could never walk past a dead man without having to examine his pockets for valuables. One day, I saw him sitting on a dead man who had a ring on one of his fingers. Jim sat with a knife trying to amputate his fingers. Yeah, yeah so you can see this is a, a different uh, portrayal of a, an American soldier that then we somehow see this, you know, sometimes called like this righteous crusader, uh, you know, uh, that, that we, we see. That, and there's this constant condemnation of, of the war in his writings. Uh, so you can almost see him as an opposite to a man like uh, Ulysses Elias and the French uh, foreign legionary that we talked about before. I mean, to, to, to Alfred, uh, the, the, the war is something undeniably bad and, and something that needs to be avoided at all costs. And it really shows in his written testimony. 
Yeah, I think, does it not remind you of that picture? Because you and I are working on something. Does it not remind mm. you of a picture of the Souvenir King? Do you remember him? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You see those, uh, a lot of people with a lot of stuff on them that they've picked up and you can't help but wonder <laughs> if, yeah. if all of them were dead when they were picked. <laughs> no, I mean, the just the story of uh, the... Um, rings being cut off the fingers mm. uh we've had an account on history hat from josh levine of that happening in london during the blitz it was uh yeah. the guy from 40 towers you know the major mm. was like an air raid warden during the blitz and i think it yeah. was the cafe de paris that got hit and uh there were people there before the emergency services doing the same thing yeah it's it's a it's a horrible thing but uh, you you find bad eggs everywhere i guess and 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 people, we sometimes think that that soldiers are above that uh, but but you also get bad people in the army, um, and this GM person, whoever he was, uh, was obviously <laughs> not not a nice guy. Um, it's like it's the it's it is where some not nice people go is the army. Mm, I and mean, Zach yeah. will tell you that researching his crime and punishment. Mm, um, exactly. And also as well, you tell these guys, you give these guys a license to murder. And then we get squeamish because they're nicking jewellery and you think, hmm, mm. there's a double standard there somewhere, isn't there? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, I want to pick uh, two episodes from, from uh, Alfred's account. Mm-hmm. Um, the first being uh, when, he's, uh, when he joins the army because I think it tells a lot about how a man like him being an immigrant could get caught up in something like this. Uh, and then uh, another part of his story from uh, uh, from his time very late in the war, uh, around October, while fighting through the the, the Mursa Gon offensive. Uh, but yeah, his his way into the army is is uh, quite swift. Uh, in uh, in November 1917, uh, he's on a train ride from South Dakota, where he worked as a farmhand to Chicago. Uh, and it, as he gets off the train at the final spot, uh, he's um, He's admiring all the, the men in uniform and the Red Cross ladies serving them coffee and cigarettes and, and stuff. And, and then he's uh, approached by a recruitment officer. Um, and then this is where he picks up the account. He writes, The officer grabbed my arm and pointed to a poster in the window and asked me, Have you seen the poster over there? Yes, of course, was my answer. For the posters were hung everywhere in the windows and posted on every house and telephone poles. On the poster was a figure of an old man with uh, white hair and his right hand raised and with the index finger sticking out towards you. And below him were the four words, Uncle Sam wants you. Have you thought about it? The officer asked me. During the trip from Dakota, it had been at the top of my mind. I'd attended an autumn worship service in Dakota. The pastor thanked the young men who had come from the city to help with the harvest, but reminded us as citizens of our duty to the flag, that the country was in danger. And if... Uh, you were young, you should relentlessly, if necessarily, suffer and die for the glorious flag, which has always brought back victory and honor. During the speech, the pastor stood waving the American flag in front of him. In the first year of the war, I'd stayed in Denmark and remembered how moved I was when I read about the Germans' shameful destruction of, of Belgium. In the first days of the war, how many people in Denmark had not feared that the same would happen to them. But Denmark did not join. Oh, how grateful the country should be. But still four years later, how many homes in Denmark didn't have an anxious mother and father worrying about a son they knew lay in the trenches? The children had traveled to foreign lands and fought for their their homeland there. Am I, as a Danish citizen, obliged to fight for Uncle Sam? I asked the officer, who shook his head and said, We have thousands of German-born men in our army, many at the front and many will follow. If America is good enough to live in, it should be good enough to fight for, and especially for a man with Danish blood in his veins, who cannot have much sympathy for Germany. You will look good in a uniform, and here is the address for the recruitment office. He was well rehearsed, wasn't he? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You'd <don't> given <laughs> but, that speech out a few times before. Yeah, exactly. And uh, yeah, you see how, uh, very well how, how a man like this can what he's thinking about uh, you know you, again you have the of course the uh, the the willingness to of course do something for your new country but you also have uh, a sense uh, of uh, of duty to your old country uh, and, and it's a it's a mix of this that that makes this account interesting and i think this goes for for a lot of the uh, um 
the hyphenated Americans at the time, that there was both uh, 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 an obligation to your new country and an obligation to your old country um, that that sometimes conflicted if you were f- uh, f- from an enemy country, if you will, mm. uh, but also sometimes could work together, like in this case. So um, I said I wanted to to uh, pick up, uh, but let me just summarize what will happen. He he goes to to join up, of course. He goes to um, to training and uh, is sent uh, across to 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 England, where he gets some more training, and then he arrives in France, uh, and he. Um, he uh, serves in the uh, third division, also nicknamed the Rock on the Mon, for for remaining steadfast uh, in the face of the German offensive in in uh, in 1918. Uh, and he arrives around the time the the division is engaged at the the Battle of Chateau Thierry, uh, and um, he's later also fighting at uh, at Saint Mihiel, uh, where he's wounded. But um, yeah, the uh, the one I wanted to to uh, to read for you is um, from the time when he's fighting in, in the Musagon offensive, the largest uh, military uh, offensive uh, in the United States history involving some 1.2 million American soldiers. Uh, and here Alfred is, is uh, tasked with establishing communications between the uh, American lines and an advance post set up in a recently captured German tren- trench. Uh, and I'll let him uh, tell the story. He writes, four men were commanded out. I was one of them. A piece of shell killed one on the way out, an infantryman. Ryan and I continued. Grenades fell all around. Out by the trench, a shell that looked like a falling star shooting through the air suddenly landed. A dazzling light and everything went dark for a few seconds. My comrades got up, but I remained down. The comrades saw how mercilessly the grenade had hurt me. Stiff with fear, one asked me, were you hit? as if he doubted what he was seeing, bent over me and said, good God. A shell sent earth and stones down over us. My two comrades ran back towards the trees. Heavily bleeding and confused, I grabbed a shoelace, and with that, uh, I stopped the bleeding and crawled a few meters to a deep shell hole and let myself roll down there. Here, I was safe against the bullets. In the hole lay two dead German soldiers. All day, I lay waiting, hoping that my comrades would bring back a stretcher, I feared that if I had to wait until darkness fell, everything would be over with such a wound. And then I'll jump a little. He's badly hurt, and he finds himself alone in the shell and continues from here. When darkness came, I tried to cry for help, but the blood loss had been too great, uh, that, uh, uh, and my strength was weak, as, and so was my voice, which could uh, not be heard far away. It was like having a bad cold. Later that night, I heard voices from another shell hole a few feet away. Was it help or was it one of the enemy patrols? I was listening for the language uh, and I seemed to catch the words, are you sure? But I was not uh, sure. And I imagined that the men out there were from the same army as the dead in the hole with me. My thoughts went to the young wounded German boy I'd seen killed two days earlier. I was afraid of the bayonet and squeezed deep into the dirt at the bottom of the shell hole. Jim, the man he talked about earlier, mm-hmm. uh, was not the only one I'd seen kill the helpless man. Um, I'd also seen many wounded Germans behind our lines, prisoners who were re- treated uh, well. Getting captured, never. My rifle was where I fell, but one of the dead had a revolver in his belt. I reached for it, and with it in my hand, I pressed myself close down against the wet, cold ground, I was afraid to move. I almost did not dare to breathe for fear that they w- would hear me breathing. Then uh, he is not discovered by the perceived enemy patrol, and he, he makes it through the night. But in the morning, the battle around him resumes, and he continues from here. Uh, in the morning, I heard that the battle was in full swing again. Gas drifted slowly over me, but, the great, but with great effort, I managed to get the mask over my face. The comrades attacked again, and they would surely—they would surely see my condition. I could hear the machine guns and wild howls to one side, but before long they were completely gone, and I was still lying in the hole. I reached over and took my neighbor's water bottle, which was filled with coffee. It eased the thirst for a while. Later, I opened their packs and searched for something edible. One pack was impossible for me to open. Second, in the second there was 
flares, a teaspoon, and a little butter. Denied food and water uh, in tremendous pain uh, and fever, he's then uh, hall- starting to hallucinate in, mm-hmm. in this hole. Uh, so he continues from there. Um, after two days of pain, hunger, and thirst, I saw myself under a large rock in pure white bed. An old man was sitting next to me. Outside, I could hear the water rushing down a cliff. Every time I stand by the Niagara Falls, uh, I remember the night out there in no man's land, an eternal deafening roar of water. When you've been without water for several days with a burning fever, with your throat and tongue so dry that it was impossible to close your mouth, then there's nothing in the world that is as precious as a small drop of water. Water, water, I shouted to the old man, <laughs> pointing to the edge of the cliff. He dragged himself out there using a long crooked stick, came back with a glass of water, shook his head and said, the war is still raging out there, but uh, do not be afraid. The grenades can't reach us down here. I tried to get up, grab the water, opened my eyes and was back on the shell hole in my desperate position. I understood that this was the beginning of delirium, delirium and unconsciousness. And it, in a way, I was grateful. Then he finally passes out, but uh, luckily he's somehow found uh, and is brought back to friendly line where he then uh, regains uh, consciousness and he continues there. Um, The doctor knelt by the stretcher and tried to remove the old bandage that I had tied around the wound three days before. I need four volunteers uh, who will bring him back to the hospital, but be careful because the trees uh, are still hiding some of the enemies. He he warned them. They lifted the stretcher I was lying up on high up over their shoulders. Uh, I had only a faint memory of the trip back. I was laid in a deep sand hole between many wounded. The wounded man next to me uh, complained pitifully. I saw a water bottle stick out from under him. I had previously asked for water, but it had been denied, and a thousand devils had not been able to stop me from stealing that bottle. I slipped my hand over and grabbed the bottle. It was full of water, but it was very dirty, and I got very sick from it. It was impossible for me to judge the time, but it felt like a long time before I woke up to a violent explosion. A shell had landed in the hole. Parts of men and sand flew to all sides. The next time I opened my eyes, I was in an ambulance. It was a painful trip. My wound, which was inflamed and swollen, was torn and bumped by an uninterrupted jumping around of the ambulance, which ran in and out of shell holes. It's not often you get such an outstanding account from a wounded man, is it? No, it isn't. Um, but yeah, the the war is over for him, but he he's... Um, He's uh, unfortunately uh, uh, he unfortunately loses his leg. Mm. Uh, the, it has to be amputated, and he news of the armistice is reaching him while he's in the hospital. Um, yeah, but um, it didn't prevent him from from uh, living a long life, and he he settled in California and frequently visited Denmark. Uh, and he died in uh, 1980 at the age of 86. Um, so he did survive, but uh, of course at a big price. Thank you so much for this. Uh, the sheer yeah, amount of effort that has gone in to um, translating all of this stuff and presenting it not in your first language is incredible. I'm sorry if it was a bit stumbling at times. No, <laughs> people, <laughs> your, your fan club. <laughs> I think it's like your third language, right? Fourth? Yeah, well, third, I would say. Yeah, you so in your in third German, language. Danish, English, yeah. Yeah, no nobody is uh judging the standard of your English, believe you. Your creepy fan club is only going to get bigger <laughs> after this. That was phenomenal. Uh so many interesting stories and all of them from Danish people, which yeah. is supposed to be neutral and people think there's nothing of interest to say perhaps about Denmark in the First World War. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Join us tomorrow. We've got specials for you because it is indeed Christmas Eve. We will be talking to Louise Creechen all about Charles Dickens and a Christmas Carol. We feel we should do something festive with you. And then in the evening, even better, Owen Staten is back. He's going to give us some more Welsh folklore with a Christmassy theme this time. So don't miss out on that one. And then on Christmas Day, when you have had enough of presents and turkey and not being able to hang out with everybody because of COVID, uh, we have a treat for you. We have another Sharp reunion. This time it's the cast of Sharp's company. So don't miss that. It's a brilliant lineup and we had loads of fun. And then on Boxing Day, when you 
you really have had enough, join us down the pub when we will um, regale you with our Christmas special. We have played Secret Santa. Currently, all of the regulars have packages sitting at their house with what we assume will be hilarity inside, and they will open them live on air. And we are also going to play another... uh, We're going to play a game. We are going to play a game whereby everybody gets allocated, much like Secret Santa, someone else in the pub, and they've got to cast them as historical characters for a theoretical panto. So join us as we basically burn each other for a couple of hours uh, for your amusement. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Alina and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join us on either of those platforms uh, marcus is currently working on some benefits for you so uh, there's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms we're revamping ourselves on both of them so don't forget to go in you can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up history hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year We are now on YouTube. We are posting all of our new episodes on there and we have our own channel and we are gradually posting all of the back episodes because we have been made aware of the fact that you can only find the last hundred on some platforms. So you can go and listen to your heart's content and laugh at the cartoons and have a great time. So do go over there and subscribe.